Our next guest is Jean Bliss, who you may know as the godmother of customer experience. She's also founder and chief executive officer of Customer Bliss, co-founder of CXPA.org, and a global thought leader on customer growth. She has 35 years of experience in this space, and she was the inaugural chief customer officer at Land's End, Coldwall Banker, Allstate, and Microsoft Corporations. Um, and since then, she's guided 20,000 leaders around the world to understanding the connection between improving lives and their strategic vision. So Jean, I'm so excited you can be with us today. Thank you for joining. Stephanie, it's so good to be with you and so good to be with everybody there. Thank you so much. So let's dive in. I mean, for starters, I've never introduced anyone that way. How do you become <laughs> the godmother of customer experience? What led you on that path? Well, you know, it's interesting because I'm one of those people who are right brain, left brain. And if you're right brain, left brain, you never quite fit into the boxes the um, companies make in terms of are you on the marketing track or the sales track? And I, I found that I wanted to be strategic, but also unite the organization and be the glue of the company. And um, so started doing that work first in retail and then actually answered an ad in the Chicago Tribune to go train 2,500 phone operators at Land's End. And um, this was in 1983, a long time ago, and we were growing 80% a year. And what happened, Stephanie, is that as we were growing, we were bringing all kinds of people in with different culture, good people, but we needed glue. And so Gary Comer, the founder, called me the conscience of the company to make sure that as we grew, we were doing what we did to continue to earn how we had gotten there in the first place. And um, it was so fascinating. I call it kind of like lightning in a bottle. And we were essentially, if you think about Zappos, the Zappos of our day, we were way early though. Um, we thought about how it felt to pull a turtleneck over your head for the first time, the emotions of uh, having your, your child's box delivered, et cetera. And after that, I knew that would be my path. And I deliberately went to different industries. After Land's End, I knew I wanted to do big and not only um, B2B, and, but B2C. And so I went to Mazda. We created the Worldwide Marketing Database and the first lifetime value model. After that, I knew I need, wanted to have the field reporting to me. So I went to Coldwell Banker and I was the first vice president of franchise services. I knew I needed to do big and financial services. So I went to Allstate Corporation and reported to the president of the personal alliance company. And then I knew, gosh, I got to do something in technology. <laughs> so I went over to Microsoft and um, did that, that role there, general manager of worldwide customer and partner loyalty. And I had been doing that for a long time and felt like every time I started, Stephanie, it was like reinventing the, the wheel. So I wrote the book I wish I had had on my desk that first came out in 2006 called Chief Customer Officer. And nobody had ever written about this weird job where people are like, what do you do? And so that began, began my odyssey of uh, continuing to do this work on and on and on and four books later and all that other good stuff. It's so great to hear your perspective because I think it's easy to take for granted today where, you know, just even the term customer experience or CX right. being audience focused is so on top of everyone's mind and on the tip of our tongues, but it wasn't talked about no. a lot. And we weren't calling it that, you know, I mean, at, at Land's End, it was very much about the organic way we thought about growing the business. But at Mazda, I had to be much more analytical about it, that, you know, showing the lifetime value of somebody who, you know, flew in and out of a vehicle or didn't have a great experience. Um, same thing at Allstate around claims and the drop in, in um, customer value. And, and so that really gave me this toolkit of blending what I call high tech and high touch or um, a, a, you know, creating congruence between how you want to show up in the world and what you need to do operationally and mechanically and culturally to achieve that. And, and that's the work that's so hard, Stephanie. People think it's about whack a mole problems away, but it's really about choosing how you're going to show up in the marketplace differently. It's leadership. You know, and, and I think that's my fear of this work is we're kind of losing the forest for the trees here. I appreciate that you brought up leadership and something that struck me when you described that first experience at Land's End is you were, you were 
in charge of being the glue for a very large team. And it's one thing for you, Jean, to sort of really be able to get into the mind of the customer, but how do you get such a large team, such a large organization, and employees at very different types of companies That's to right. on that ride with you? Well, and what's fascinating about that is I was 24 back then. Wow. I was an itty bitty dumb thing, just, you know, trying to throw do body slams. And, you know, there's so many lessons that I've learned along the way that I also put in my books around how to be successful in these roles. But over time, it you realize you have to give people a seat at the table. This can't be about you pushing or selling, but rather engaging others to have their own aha lights turn on. And so, so much of it, Stephanie, is about the underbelly what motivates people to act, how they're rewarded, what the language of leaders is, how consistently it is. Do you have one version of the truth for how you're doing? And do you have a common conversation or language around what your purpose in the world is in terms of improving lives? And so much of that is what people don't do. That's missing in so much of this work. You you just led me to my next question. So maybe you can expand on that. So, you know, my view is that everyone is really taking a hard look at customer experience right now. Right. I'm wondering, what is the biggest mistake that you see companies making as they go through a CX transformation? We're, we're looking at the transformation through the lens of the silos and the silo KPIs and also often survey results or validating how we're doing versus understanding what the customer needs. Now, all well-intended. Um, but what happens is every operating area will have their own individual KPI around what will give them a green dot or a red dot or a yellow dot. But those things don't have sometimes necessarily anything to do with what the customer is trying to achieve because they're giving you their money. The other thing that we do is we look at survey scores or dashboards and we react again down a silo. So we create this proliferation of action items and tasks and we give our CEOs and our leaders a false positive that we're working on all this stuff, but we're measuring action, not outcome the customer can see. And that quite honestly too, Stephanie, is why this work is gonna die a death if we don't rethink and rejigger, if you will, how we look at what the work is and what our purpose is. You're touching on another, I think, pain point that everyone is dealing with right now, which is the feeling of drowning in data. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, you can have all the data in the world, but if you're not aligned on, on the data, you're not looking at the right data, um, you, like you said, you can get a false positive. That's such a, way, a good way to put it. So what's the solution there in terms of, you know, the data? To well, the I, yeah, sorry, I talked over you because I was so excited. Um, you know, we need to simplify it. So, you know, as you might all remember, we were all really engaged with CRM and data when that happened. But what happened was instead of going back to the origin processes that we were going to automate, we just automated what we already were doing. So we were basically doing what I call auto automating mediocrity, right? We, and, and again, because we went silo by silo, our eyes roll into the back of our heads as the dashboards are proliferated, the typeface gets smaller, and we don't have a simplified view of what our purpose is. And so what I've been driving people toward, you know, instead of thinking about a journey map is think about a goal map. What are the four or five goals that your customers need to be able to say that they achieved because they put money in your pocket? And what that does, it starts to glue the silos together and becomes this kind of wonderful forcing function of the mirror, the conscious question of, are, can the customer say they achieved this because they're interacting with us? And, and we've just got to simplify it. We've overcomplicated it. Can you, on that topic, can you break down the difference between a goal map and a journey map? And sure. then how do, you, how do you go about building the, the goal map? What are the first steps of that? You bet. So when I ask a lot of people what their journey map is, and again, I'm not saying they're not good, but often a journey map is very internal. So I'll say, what's your journey map? And guess what, Stephanie, it's their sales pipeline. Prospect, uh, download, conquest, you know, sell, onload, board, resell, advocate. That has nothing to do with the customers being able to achieve things. Those are things you want to earn, but you need to start with what the customer needs to achieve. For example, here's a great, a great one that I always tell because it's simple. We were doing the work with Bombardier Aerospace, a great company in Canada. 
and we were working on um, the part of the organization that sold private planes to high wealth individuals. So again, the, in, the inclination is to do a journey based on silos. Your care, customers don't care about your silos. But the great service and parts people said, let's talk about the service and parts experience. Do you think these people care about a service and parts experience, Stephanie? No. no. They want to keep me flying experience. The keep me flying experience means do we have the right number of pilots? Are we cleaning the planes correctly? Are we measuring how much time people are in the air? And are we measuring the cycle time of when they go down when they don't want to, how fast we get them up and how clearly we communicate with them? The outcome of that, Stephanie, is you will sell more service and parts, but you earn it by delivering what the customer cares about, which is staying up in the air. And that's the flip. That's the Vulcan mind melt. That's what I do with people. I love that. And you mentioned kind of in passing earlier in our conversation, the importance of purpose. Yes. You tell a great story about your dad. Yes. You know, talk about purpose. Um, that you refer to as three blocks long. Can you share that story? I, I would love to. And it's always a, a great privilege and an honor to talk about my dad. His name was Vincenzo Giuseppe Cristando Lombardo. <laughs> and, it, you know, I had this wonderful, you know, mentorship, if you will. First, I sat as my other six brothers and sisters did, kind of watching my dad. He had a Buster Brown shoe store and he shooed a generation of children and their children's children. And, and he did what we all hope for, which is he became a part of the story of people's lives. So much so when they thought about that time, whether it was the first pair of shoes or for a great event or Christmas or whatever it is, my dad was in, as part of the story. And he, when he retired, Stephanie, you know, this man who never felt like he was financially uber prosperous as much as he had thought he would be. However, he had a line of people three blocks long stood, stand to say goodbye to him that buying shoes would never be the same. And he ultimately became very prosperous in that critical way because people remembered him. And wherever he went then, he always had followers who followed him. And that to me, Stephanie, is what's missing in so much of these transformations is figuring out your three blocks long, which is how do you wanna be remembered? As a result of the behavior and what you deliver, how do you wanna be defined as people? What are the goals you want customers to say that they've achieved because you were in their life? And how do you then connect that back to the work of your people so you're all glued together in that higher purpose? That story actually gives me goosebumps. I mean, just yeah. imagining, and, and that's another way to look at it too, like the day you retire, right? Or, or the day your company closes shop, how, you know, how do you want people to be remembered? How do you want people to feel about that? Um, I wonder- well, It can also be, if I can interrupt, and in, in operational things, right? So, you know, for a call center rep, when you hang up the phone, how do you want to be remembered about how you treated that person? You know, when I was at Allstate, for example, you know, you have to turn claims down. But you can turn a claim down in two ways. First, by being a policy cop and telling somebody how dumb they are and just reading the rules back. The second is with empathy, walking them through, being their advocate and helping them make a better decision next time. In both situations, you turn down the claim, but the customer felt completely different about you and the company in the second one. I was going to ask, too, if you have any good examples of, you know, like three blocks long inspiration that you have seen implemented um, either either in your career at one of the companies you worked for or um, maybe one of the brands that you've worked with or are familiar with? Sure. Well, yeah. And all of this becomes a really important, not only Kumbaya kind of purpose framework, but operationally as well. So I live in Seattle and there's a great case study in my book called Would You Do That to Your Mother about um, the Seattle Spine Clinic. And their purpose, their three blocks long, is to make sure that people um, get back up walking and back to normal as quickly as possible, right? And so what they did was they put their silos where their mo mantra was and they got rid of all the bumps in the road and the monkeys on your back that usually happen when you try to get your back pain fixed. Usually you have to go to a primary care doc or an MRI person or a tech and you bounce and bounce and bounce. You lose days of work. And again, the false positive, Stephanie, is how much time is it taking you to sit in the waiting room till you get to somebody? We don't care about that. What they care about is how many missed days of work you have, 
and how many reduced MRIs they're able to not have you have because they've united the, the, the technology and the people and the connecting. And so it's kind of when you start with your keep me flying or get me upright quicker, that that then becomes the glue that, you know, it's like that conscience question Gary Comer had, okay, what are we constantly gonna ask as we go through our reviews, our conversations, our discussions? Yeah, I appreciate you connecting it to operations. Yes. Because, uh, we, we, yeah, we don't always necessarily talk about purpose when we talk about operations, but it has um, you know, such a far reaching effect. You know, you've, you have such an interesting vantage point because you have been thinking about this for a long time. Long time. Um, I'm wondering just how have you seen customer experience um, or purpose around customer? Yeah evolve over time? Well, you know, it's interesting. There's always great forcing functions that occur in the marketplace that cause companies to shift. You know, we had TQM, we had quality. Um, we had a situation where um, we had market crashes. Then we had um, social media was a great forcing function for those of us in the world of earning the right to grow because it couldn't be any more about what you said you were, but rather what your customer said you're, you are based on what you actually do. And, and I would say the, the, the next big thing is too, and coincidentally, I had been working on my new website where I was talking about humanity and business and three blocks long for a year before COVID hit. But it's this whole notion of becoming an admired company earning growth through the admirable acts of how you choose to grow and being just as deliberate about what you won't choose to grow. Um, for example, Raul Leal, who um, started the, the, the Virgin Hotels said, you know, they don't charge for Wi-Fi. They consider it a right, not a revenue stream. When you want a, a can of Coke or a bottle of water, they actually have people go into the marketplace and see how much that costs in the, in, in the neighborhood grocery store. Because, you know, who, who among us loves cracking open a $7 bottle of water in the middle of the night? So, so this is all about showing up different, better and, and with more balance because you're imagining the life and you're, you're doing what's right, not what you could. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the fundamental shift that we're seeing that was foisted upon us as we were all sitting in our sweaters with dogs and sometimes guys in tidy whities running across screens and all the other crazy stuff that was happening was that we got to know each other as people. Mm -hmm. And this cracking of the corporate veneer you know, I think is really important. And I really hope that that's what we stick with. And, and again, for me, it's back to, you know, you need for your three blocks long, you need to know it, you need to build it, and then you need to live it. But it and it is a path, but people don't do the work, they don't do the hard work to build that into their ethos, their operating model, how they reward and how leaders consistently talk to one another and to the organization. Yeah, it is. It has been such a time of vulnerability. And in a way, yes. it, it makes it easier to get in touch with humanity, right? To really yes. think of each other as humans and seeing each other in, in a new light. Um, I wonder too, just has, has the application of your principles changed at all in the pandemic? And do you have any advice for marketers out there who are trying to understand what feels like very rapidly changing consumer habits? Well, it's fascinating. I, I, I started working on these five competencies that are in the CCO 2.0 book that first came out in 2006 and then came out later. And those fundamentally still make sense, but it's always the translation of them. How do you honor the customer as the asset of your business? And every single one of these things, you have to make it your own. I think the biggest shift that I made was instead of talking about a journey map, talking about a goal map, um, instead of building a listening path, just about validating through sur surveys, we're really doing what I call understanding the life versus validating how we're doing, which is completely shifting. You know, we're, we're into ethnography, we're hiring people who are, you know, cultural geologists to follow people home, not in a creepy right way, and be innovative based on lives versus having customers, you know, pat us on the back and say, hey, you, you add a boy, you did a good job on, on the onboarding. That's not what the customer cares about. Yeah. And we're almost out of time. This has ah. gone really quickly, but I want to ask you one more question. Sure. You've written books, you host podcasts, and you always 
end your podcast episodes with the question, what do you know now that you wish you knew then? So I'll ask you, what do you know now that you wish you knew then? Well, I, I, I kind of go back to that 24 year old version of myself. And, and the, you know, as I got a little older and older working through companies, it's shine a light on others. You need to check your ego at the door and look at your job in this role as being the uniter and the enabler of helping people see the aha light and make it their own versus pitching and begging and being the one who is the, the hero. And I think as soon as, you know, and that's difficult, Stephanie, because we're so used to silo metrics and what we achieved versus in a CCO or someone leading this for a period of time, it's more about what they've enabled the organization to accomplish and the behaviors that now exist because of the work that was done. Yeah, that's such a great note to end on, sort of bringing, being the glue, bringing it all together. That's right, be the glue in service of the customer. So Jean, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed this conversation. I think our audience can get a lot out of it and appreciate you taking the time today. It's my pleasure. Everybody stay safe out there. And uh, it was a thrill to talk to you, Stephanie.